Hello and welcome to this online lecture on the causes of the American Civil War. This um, lecture is a continuation of the kind of long-term factors that we spoke about during the 1850 Compromise class. Today we're going to look at um, factors or events that really run from 1850 or post-1850 Compromise right through until the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861. We will not study the Civil War um, itself at this at this point. There are um, two things we're going to look at here, which is events, um, as I said, that take place over a kind of 10 year um, period. And then we're going to touch very briefly on what happens in 1861 itself. So what are the kind of very short term causes that actually leads to war? Who fires the first shots, for example, um, might be a way of looking at that um, event or incident that leads to the Civil War. But that um, moment when shots are first fired, are obviously a product of what happens in the 10 years beforehand and then you can go further back and say really it's what has been going on since the 1820 um, Missouri um, Compromise. So we're going to start with um, a little bit of information on historiography because this is fundamental to the essay on the causes of the American Civil War. The essay question um, focuses on blame and it focuses on whether or not the South were primarily responsible for the outbreak of the war or if the North were primarily responsible for the outbreak of the war. And there's also a view that you're going to have to look at, which maybe argues both um, sides have to take their, their fair share of responsibility. Now, the historiography of slavery and the causes of the Civil War have, um, like every other type of historiography, developed over you know the last um, 150 years or so. When the Civil War immediately ended, there was a view that slavery was somehow the cause of the war, and that was a phrase that Lincoln himself used in his inaugural um, speech for his second term in office, that you couldn't necessarily quite put your finger on it in what way slavery was the cause of the war, but it was a fundamental difference between the North and the South that it had to play some part. Those historians who rejected the idea of slavery being the cause of the war, um, tended to think about other issues like states' rights. And that suited Southerners post-Civil War because they say, well, look, the question may have been, uh, or the issue may have been slavery, but the bigger question, the bigger picture was state rights, what states could do and what states couldn't do. Maybe the federal government was trying to interfere in states' rights, and it just happened to be that slavery was the issue, but the bigger picture was state rights. That argument is actually presented very early after the war by Alexander Stevens, who was the Vice President of the Confederate States. You would have to bear that in mind if you were to approach such a, a position. During the 1920s and 30s you have progressive historians who argue that the cause of the war was economic, even some of these historians you could argue are Marxist in their interpretation, and the view here was that a transformation of the American economy, especially in this new territory um, of the Louisiana Purchase in the West could only really be um, successful. This transformation would only really benefit the United States if it was done with free labour, free white labour, ideally. Although um, capitalists tend not to care too much about where they get their labour from. But free labour was um, vital to the spread of, of capitalism across the United States. Slavery was incompatible with a modern capitalist nation. So that economic factor is there. And then you've got the human agency argument, which to some extent we are going to, or you are going to explore within this essay question, the idea that it wasn't really um, that the country was divided deeply. The country actually had lots of things in common. It's just that a few extremists in the north and a few extremists in the south pushed the country into um, directions that the country would prefer not to go down. And therefore, the failure to find a compromise, the failure to kind of work um, a way out of this kind of dilemma, mostly about slavery, arguably, um, was not down to slavery itself, it was down to human beings, politicians, abolitionists, journalists who were responsible for creating tension in, in the United States. Now, these views um, prevailed up until the 60s and then after the 1960s we start to get a return to slavery as being the, the cause. And what I think really we um, have to focus on is the idea that it's not just slavery, the existence of slavery, but it's the idea of slavery expanding into these new territories. It's the extension of slavery that is the ultimate cause of the American Civil War. There is 
evidence that we'll look at later which suggests that Lincoln himself was not opposed to slavery being abolished in the South, although he was morally opposed to the whole concept of slavery, he was not claiming that it could be abolished or should be abolished in the South. All he was saying was that it should not be allowed to extend into new territories. The Republican Party um, that Lincoln um, eventually would represent um, had this view at the very heart of their um, uh, kind of ideology. In your essay, you will look at two competing views, one that argues that the South were to blame, one that says that both sides were to blame. The side that says, or the argument that both sides were to blame comes from the historian um, Avery Craven and James Randall. You can look at either of these. I think Craven may be a good place to start, but Randall can add to it. They're both quite short extracts, so you can dump them or lump them in together. And we call this approach um, a revisionist interpretation. So you've got the slavery as a cause, and then you've got the revisionist um, view. What is um, important to remember here is that Craven and Randall's writings actually come before Stamp's writings. Stamp writes after Craven and Randall. Um, so something to think about when you write this um, essay, the chronology of historiography. So this is where we are at, and therefore as you think about what we're going to look at as we run through these key events and the build up to the outbreak of war, I want you to think about um, not just causation, but who might be culpable in, in causing this, this conflict. So I'll touch on it, I'll ask questions as we run through the slides. Were the South more likely to blame for certain events? Were the North more likely to blame for certain events? And in the um, essay, you will use this evidence, these events, to support the extract you'll read from Stamp and the extract you'll read from Craven um, and Randall or Craven um, and Randall or Craven or Randall. So let's begin, and we're going to begin with a place um, that we have already um, kind of touched on briefly, and that is um, the South and the South's fear of losing um, slaves. So therefore, we're going to focus on the Future of Slave Act, which, as you know, was strengthened with the 1850 Compromise. This is one of the component parts of the 1850 Compromise um, bills that was beneficial to the, the South. Now, there's a lot of information that I've thrown at you in this slide and do not worry about, um, but we'll stick to the, the basics. On my city, you can actually uh, read the extract from the Future of Slave Law that um, basically stipulated what was allowed and what wasn't allowed um, post-1850 uh, compromise. I'm going to read you a little extract um, from this Fugitive Slave um, Law. And it says, Any person who shall knowingly and willingly obstruct, hinder or prevent, so we're really talking about Northerners here, um, a slave owner trying to return or have his slave return to him, those people who obstruct will be fined $1,000 um, and with the possibility of a six months prison sentence added as well. So, here we've got a remarkable um, change in the nature of how the whole fugitive slave issue was going to be dealt with. Slaves were being denied, or fugitive slaves were being denied the right to a trial, right to a jury, uh, the right to testify. Why? Because if they escaped, Federal Marshals could, or not could, should, were told to raise a local posse or militia, people who wanted to do this, first and foremost, if not, recruitment would take place, and there would be um, a legal obligation to pursue these fugitive slaves on northern soil, and um, obviously fines for those who did not. Now, this was an issue for northern um, abolitionists, northerners in general, but especially abolitionists, who felt that all of a sudden slavery was migrating north, right? The um, sinful institution of slavery, which was bad enough, you know, when it was contained within the south, now some of its ideas, now its presence was being felt within um, the north. And in places like Massachusetts, which were historically um, abolitionist strongholds, we get a real sense that this is a, a grave um, injustice, a real um, negative element of the 1850 Compromise. This is quite an old um, source, right, but it's actually quite useful. It's from 1935 from um, historian uh, Wilbur Siebert. And um, it's useful because it gives you a direct idea or sense of how um, Northerners responded to the 1850 Compromise. 
And here you get two famous, very famous abolitionists of the day being referred to. The first one um, that is referred to as Mr. Garrison, right? That's William Lloyd Garrison, who was um, a, a journalist and a, a kind of activist who was completely opposed to all forms of slavery. And he um, boasted publicly that you know, there was no need for slaves to leave Boston once the future of slave law had been passed because they were safe there because Bostonians would never ever submit to this um, 1850 compromise. And then the second individual you um, are um, introduced to is Theodore Parker, another abolitionist, who tells an audience on uh, October 6th, uh, Massachusetts, that um, from um, 400 to 600 fugitives in Boston, that they should be slightly concerned because they're exposed to the operation of this new um, fugitive slave law. And as a result, some had already decided to leave. Canada would be the best place to go if you wanted complete security, because that was obviously part of the... British Empire, um, and Parker says he asked whether he could stand uh, by and see some of his own flock carried back to bondage and do nothing at all. In such a case, they would call Parker um, an infidel, a highland shepherd, a sheep in most clothing. He declared that he owed no allegiance to such an iniquitous law and would help and defend the fugitive with all his humble means. Here we've got um, Garrison and Parker, abolitionists in the north, basically saying, right, um, almost immediately after the passage of the 1850 Compromise, we are not going to accept it. We are going to refuse to uphold the North part of the bargain with this 1850 Compromise. Why should they have upheld it? Why um, should a kind of deal done by politicians in Washington affect this moral issue um, in Massachusetts? So you can read through a little bit more of uh, this source and some of the kind of ways that these abolitionists stirred up the... Um, people who lived in, in, in Massachusetts and Boston in particular, and how you can maybe see the, the northern parts of the, the country edging more and more towards a, a kind of full and abolitionist um, position, which had not been the case prior to the 1850 Compromise. Um, then you get a little story in the last two um, sections about, um, just to kind of give you an example, an illustration of fugitive slaves. And the example we get is one of the most fascinating. You can actually read a bit more about this online if you want. Um, William Craft and Ellen Craft, who left um, Georgia and made their way to Boston. Um, and the reason why this story is interesting is, is simply because Ellen Craft was a light-skinned African-American. Her um, husband, William, was not. And their daring, uh, so he looked like a, a more traditional slave, so their daring escape was for Ellen to dress as a white male, a plantation owner, who needed jaw surgery, so her head was bandaged. So she looked like she could be a man. She had cut her hair short to give that impression. She didn't speak because her jaw was um, obviously um, requiring some type of surgery. And William was going north with her to look after her. So a servant basically going with their um, plantation owner. And they, um, they managed to scrape their way past a few um, precarious situations with um, ID not being required basically because um, people were sympathetic to their, 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 their cause. They make their way to Philadelphia and um, eventually freedom in, in Boston. Um, and their story really uh, caught the imagination of those who started to favour abolition. Um, and what we see is that they eventually decided to move on to England for complete um, safety. Um, here is an example of the Underground Railroad which existed in the south and through the border states up into the, the north. Uh, now the Underground Railroad was not an actual railroad, it was different forms of transport that would be used over the course of a slave's journey as they tried to flee, but none of these were actual um, railroad carts. Um, and you can see that this was a highly um, kind of organised and well planned out way that slaves, once they got to a certain point, might find themselves being offered help and assistance. And news of the Underground Railroad starts to spread into the south and onto slave plantations. And this puts great fear into slave owners who think that all their slaves are going to want to start to run away. Um, and it gives, um, again, further credit to this argument that the North is rejecting and completely ignoring the terms of the 1850 Compromise. Um, one of the kind of most famous stories of the Underground Railroad is one that you can watch in a movie that came out um, last year, a really, um, really excellent movie called Harriet. It's the story of Harriet Tubman, a um, slave who ran away herself and then took the journey back on numerous occasions to try and um, rescue um, 
some of her family members as well as any other black people uh, from Maryland who wished to um, make their way north uh, and then maybe eventually to St Catharines. Um, and there's a real brilliant scene in the movie in Philadelphia where you see some of the slave catchers trying to um, basically do, do their best to, to, to bring slaves back just at the point when the 1850 compromise is, is passed. So it's a real excellent um, film to watch to kind of capture um, the period that we are that we are talking about. So the question therefore is, um, did um, the North not stick to its part of the 1850 compromise bargain? Did abolitionists um, upset Southerners because they refused to comply with the law? Was this just a question of principle more than a reality of slaves being lost because um, on average um, there weren't really that many fugitive slaves. Um, only 332 would ever returned. Figures suggest maybe only a thousand per year escaped. Out of four million slaves that's a very small um, number. Therefore this is more about resentment between the two sections rather than any kind of real practical loss to slave um, owners. Although the individual slave owner may have felt the financial loss, it was more a question of the South defending its position. Now linked to, to some extent to the Fugitive Slave Law was the treatment of slaves in general and the shift or the movement towards the North becoming more and more staunch in its abolitionist uh, views is the publication in 1852 of Uncle Tom's Cabin. This book which is <coughs> uh, still um, particularly well known to, to, the, to this day and there's a podcast you can actually listen to from the In Our Time series that you can find um, on BBC Radio 4's um, archive that um, is dedicated just to, to this book and it's really good, you get a really good um, idea about what the book's about. Now the term Uncle Tom has been used for a long time now in, um, in African American communities by African Americans as a derogatory term um, labelling um, blacks who seem to be too sympathetic towards whites and too sympathetic to accept and um, you know white rule white government and the reason why this term Uncle Tom um, really came to um, be used was partly because during the 1960s it was often something that was thrown at those who were involved in the civil rights movement they were deemed to be Uncle Toms because they weren't as radical as maybe some of those involved in the black power movement which is actually really unfair and the reason why that term is used is because the character in the book, Uncle Tom, is deemed to be submissive, which is not really the case because when you read um, Source 2 here, Tom really does stick up for himself. Um, I'll show you the, the sources um, here, which you can again read um, at your own time. But where I've asked this, uh, um, put the asterisk here, um, you can read this kind of little passage about um, Uncle uh, Tom's experience as a slave. And this is published in 1852. It becomes a bestseller, right, this book. And you can... Um, get a sense of how important this book was because Lincoln himself read it, Lincoln himself when he became president actually met Harriet Beecher Stowe who wrote the book and said are you the woman who is responsible for causing this great war because that was the view held in the south that this book was a piece of northern propaganda that was trying to convince uh, white northerners that slavery was so loathsome, so vile, so um, violent that it had to come um, to an end and in the book, and you can read the passage in the extract yourself, um, you get a presentation of all the horrible aspects of slavery, which you are familiar with by now. One of them is also the violence um, dished out, and you can see that perfectly in the extract um, that I've, I've put on here. But also the division and the splitting up of families was another cruel aspect of, of slavery. So all of the attempts by the South to try and defend the institution were um, taken, um, I guess, down. Uh, by Harriet Beecher Stowe in, in this book. Um, Northerners um, loved the book so much that it sold out. Southerners took this, the book as a sign that all Northerners were, were, were kind of rabid um, abolitionists. And Southerners actually responded by trying to publish books that were sympathetic to um, obviously slavery and critical of Northern um, workers and how they were treated um, in the kind of industrial capitalist world that was emerging in the North. So all we get really with the Fugitive Slave Law being um, ignored in the North and the, the publication of um, Uncle Tom's Cabin is just greater division. Sectional tension increases in the immediate aftermath of the 1850 Compromise. The 1850 Compromise really seems to be a rather pointless um, kind of um, set of legislation um, as, as early as kind of 1852.
And in 1852, we have another election. Okay, the main candidates running here are Winfield Scott, um, war hero from the Mexican War, Whig, and the Democrat Franklin Pierce, a bit of an unknown. He was put forward as a bit of an unknown because they thought he could not um, upset um, too many people in the Democrat Party between North and South. You can see this is really the beginnings of the end of the Whig Party. They um, are absolutely crushed in the Electoral College vote, which is quite remarkable, 86% to 14%. Um, so, disaster for the Whig Party. The reason why this is a, a disaster for the Whig Party is because their party is the first to really feel the strains of tension between North and South. How do you kind of keep together a party where your Northern members want slavery abolished, or at least no, um, no further examples of, of, of slavery in the West? And those in the South are still very much in favour of slavery and expansion of slavery in the West. So the Whig Party are the first to go, and that's because some of their members moved their allegiances to a new political movement, which we'll see in 1856, which is known as the, the, the Know Nothing Movement or the Nativist Movement. There's an ugly side to the Nativist Movement. It was quite racist, it was anti Catholic, anti Semitic. Disliked the idea of immigrants coming to um, America, and a big part of that comes um, during this period because. Irish men, women and children had been leaving Ireland uh, since 1847 really when the, the, the famine became um, incredibly challenging to people back um, back home in Ireland. So you have lots of Irish poor Catholics coming to um, the north and they like to drink and have a good time and that was too much for some kind of uh, white um, Protestant kind of moralists. Um, in um, northern cities. So the Whig Party lose votes to this new movement, which we'll look at in 1856. So Franklin Pierce becomes president. Pierce um, is never really known as being a particularly good American president. He does try and maybe divert the country away from the kind of fixation of what is going on within the West, slavery or um, um, free soil. He maybe tries to unite the country by diverting the country towards a foreign policy kind of administration and one of the ways that he tries to do this and you get to do this on my say is he tries to maybe encourage um, the acquisition of Cuba as a potential state to the USA he um, is very keen on encouraging expeditions one such expedition is to Japan where there is a, a kind of deal done with the Japanese to open up Japanese markets to America for the first time and there is um, some other kind of attempts to bring in maybe Nicaragua to the Union if Nicaragua could be settled by kind of pro-American, pro-slave interests. So um, Pierce actually, in his attempt to unite the nation, he totally fails because it looks like he's trying to have a foreign policy that could benefit the South and the expansion of slavery. And Northerners call him out on this. And there's a bit of a political controversy over uh, Pierce's uh, administration declaring that if Cuba will or if the Spanish will not allow America to buy Cuba, um, they may have to take it by force. When that came out in the press, Pierce had to back down, and foreign policy quickly shifted back towards the settlement of the West. And one of the key things that would be um, discussed and spoken about and planned with the idea of settling all of these territories, this large Louisiana Purchase territory that still needed settled, especially in the northern half, and the idea of connecting the, the entire country, um, to the Pacific Ocean and the Mexican session that had been taken after the Mexican War. Um, all of that now comes into play and the only way you could really unite the nation would be to do so physically and to do so physically you need a railroad that would go from the east right through to the west. There were different views at this point within the American um, Congress, within the American press as to which route should be used for the um, what would become this kind of um, transcontinental railroad. Some northerners wanted it in Chicago, others believed it should be in the middle of the country. In Missouri, others believed that it should come from Texas, because that was the most kind of advanced western point, um, and therefore Houston is in Texas. And some believed it should come in the very uh, furthest part of the south, New Orleans, where there was um, access to a very um, successful and thriving port. Now, this would also be a political issue. Um, where should this begin? So it's also something that's debated. Um, ideally, um, it would take place um, in a location that would satisfy all Americans, North and South, but in this period that is highly unlikely. Um, if it was to be in the South, it would have to go 
to be part of um, Mexico, the northern part of Mexico. So the Congress, um, led by Jefferson Davis, Davis, um, key figure actually in the Senate, um, convinces the American government to purchase um, part of um, New, or sorry, North Mexico, um, that would then become part of um, Arizona and New Mexico. And he um, he pays 10 million for this, but his attempts to have a southern railroad from Texas um, actually uh, do not come to fruition at this point. It did suggest to Northerners though that there is a slave power at work. Pierce being a pro kind of southern politician president by the looks of it appears to be submitting to some of these demands. The problem for northern politicians who definitely don't want a southern railroad is if they go for a northern railroad or a railroad that's kind of in the midwest or above the latitude 30, um, 3630 is that they're going to be you know, planning and building this railroad through territories that have yet to be settled. And if workers come into these territories, and if people come into these territories, then you're going to very soon have a demand for that territory to become a state. If that territory was going to declare its desire to become a state, then the question is what? The question is, would that state be a free state, free soil state, or would it be a slave state. And the location where this um, railroad would, you know, eventually um, be um, successfully decided to run through is known as the Nebraska Territory. And one particular bit of the Nebraska Territory, the bottom part of it, which was eventually called the Kansas Territory. So quite often we will hear discussions about Kansas, Nebraska. You will read about Kansas, Nebraska. Kansas, Nebraska is read about or you will read about it because an act was passed in 1854 by um, pushed forward by um, Senator Stephen Douglas, the individual who was responsible for the success of the 1850 Compromise. Douglas gets a deal done where he hoped the railroad would go through Missouri, which was ideal for um, Douglas because his state was Illinois. He was a senator of Illinois. He had lots of real estate in this area, could make money. It wouldn't do his chances of becoming president. Um, any harm at all if he could push through this law and um, the fact that it was going to happen right in the centre of the country and through Missouri um, means that you know he was doing his best to um, placate both the north and the south because Missouri even though it's above 3630 um, was a slave state so the railroad would go through Kansas um, part of Utah New Mexico all the way to California and what um, we get is a serious problem with the Kansas Nebraska and the serious problem can be seen with this um, little source it actually comes from the American Senate um, website so January 4th 1854 Douglas introduces a bill he pro proposes giving this vast territory in Kansas Nebraska where the railroad will go he says let's let's not have any restrictions in slavery but let's not say slavery can be extended here let's go with the idea that we spoke about back in 1850, popular sovereignty. Now, as soon as this idea of popular sovereignty was uh, going to be implemented in a Kansas-Nebraska Act, a piece of legislation, the 1820 Missouri Compromise and that line going across the country would now be rendered um, pointless, redundant. So the 1854 Kansas-Nebraska Act actually um, results in the 1820 Compromise being um, uh, overturned. Now, for Douglas this was great because this would be financial opportunities, he calls it the onward march of civilization with a railroad going as far west as possible. Southerners put pressure on Douglas to include that the Missouri Compromise could be no more. Southerners were quite happy with this deal because it meant that slavery could now possibly expand into Kansas where under the Missouri Compromise terms it could not. So Southerners like what Douglas is doing, Northerners are disgusted, especially, especially um, abolitionists. Now the bill is passed, right, it goes through the Senate. The kind of abolitionist element within the Senate, Sam and Chase um, and Charles Sumner, who are mentioned at the bottom, they see this as being a disaster for the country. And these new territories, according to Sumner, who was a radical, um, would be um, yeah lead to a dreary region of despotism um, inhabited by masters and slaves, um, and then you can see that the Senate vote does pass the Nebraska Bill, 
um, enough moderates from the north to think that they can um, do well from it. These people are influenced by Douglas, and Douglas himself is a northern senator, so it passes fairly easily. Um, and right at the very end, Stephen Douglas had touted his bill as a peaceful settlement of national issues, but what it produced was a prelude to civil war, and there's no getting away from that. Um, this would be um, the beginnings of um, violence that would eventually lead to full scale civil war in 1861. So northerners not happy, southerners um, like the idea of um, popular sovereignty. Now, who really can take advantage of popular sovereignty are, you could argue, extremists on both sides. If you think about, again, this question about who is responsible for the causes of the American Civil War, we have to think about, okay, who was responsible for creating tension in the lead up to eventually the Civil War. Tension, you could say there, was um, unintentionally created by Douglas. But when we get to what we call Bleeding Kansas between 1854 and 1856, both sides are um, instrumental in causing tension and violence. And it's up to you to maybe try and work out if you think one side is more culpable than the other during this period. Um, so who's going to settle this area known as the Kansas Territory? Well, slaves are going to be taken there by their slave owners. There are freemen coming from the north, free soilers who want to go to Kansas, maybe just to start up a, a new homestead, a new farm, a new opportunity, but there are others who go with the intention there to make sure that Kansas is a free soil state. You have got not just so much abolitionists, but um, American farmers in general from the north who think that enough of the land, a bit like the Wilmot Proviso, enough of the land has been set aside for slaves. This has got to be a white man's territory. In fact, most of the West really has to be a white man's territory to secure the future of white America. So when Kansas is eventually set up and becomes a state, um, it bars black people from coming, slave or free. So it's um, there's a race issue here as well from a northern um, perspective. When the area is settled, right, in an attempt to you know get enough people in there to make Kansas a state, um, you've got all sorts of kind of dodgy characters going. Um, who are spoiling for a fight. There is example of both southern aggression and northern aggression. Much of the southern aggression comes from those living in Missouri who were paid sometimes by politicians to go into Kansas. These are slave owners, poor slavers. Go into Kansas, start some fights, start some violence in an attempt to basically ensure that the slave um, states would dominate and Kansas and Kansas would become a slave state. When a vote would eventually have to take place on whether or not Kansas would become a slave state or not, popular sovereignty would be the method used and because of the levels of violence and corruption, nobody could truly trust this type of vote. In fact, men were coming over from Missouri and voting and then going back to Missouri without any intention whatsoever of becoming a citizen of, of Kansas. Violence breaks out in 1856. In May of 1856 we have what is known as the Sack of Lawrence, which is when um, the free state town of Lawrence was um, basically burned to the ground by um, poor slavers. The response comes at um, Potawatomi Creek, which is where um, pro-slave men are dragged out of their bed and hacked to death and thrown in the river by one particular individual by the name of John Brown and his um, and his sons. And then um, Brown is not charged for any of this. He goes he goes back um, he goes back north after this. Look at real violence, right? Real sense that the country the divide in the country is being played out in a um, kind of smaller version in, in Kansas. Um, here we've got um, letters from um, Edward Bridgman right from May of eighteen fifty six. They're really useful he's writing to his cousin um, Sydney, and the first um, source at the top talks about the violence in Lawrence and exactly what happens there and the presence of pro-slaver southern ruffians as he calls, call, uh, calls them and then below in the next letter a few days later he writes back to Sydney and this time he tells them of the violence that he's heard of at Potawatomi uh, which was next to Osawatomi and um, he has heard as it says here, that the Browns were responsible for this um, violence. So you've got both Northern and Southern 
something like exam examples of violence. John Brown, who was, you know, avidly anti um, anti slavery, he saw himself as having this calling from God to free black people. He would argue that he responded to the violence that took place in Lawrence. All Northerners would say they were responding to, responding to the cheating that was going on in terms of bringing in Missourians to the state who would never eventually sell. When a vote does eventually take place, the South win, wins it. Kansas would be a slave state. But nobody really accepts it because they know that there's been bribery and corruption. Eventually, when a second vote is taken, the North wins it and Kansas becomes a free state. But neither Southerners or Northerners are willing to accept either of the um, decisions. So we get chaos in Kansas. And it's uh, an example of the um, Civil War before the Civil War begins. What goes on within Kansas even says to the floor of the Senate. And we get in 1856 what is sometimes referred to as Bleeding Sumner. To complement Bleeding Kansas, we have Bleeding Sumner. May 1856, um, there's quite a lot of information here. Um, Charles Sumner, who you can see lying on the floor here with his quill in his hand, has been beaten by a... Um, Southern um, Senator, on the floor of the Senate, a guy by the name of Preston Brooks. Now the reason for this beating um, is linked to a letter um, or a, a speech made by Charles Sumner and the speech you can read in the other parts of this um, slide and you can read it again on, on my side. Um, Sumner basically says that, you know, slavery is a, is a sin and he accuses um, Andrew Butler of um, South Carolina as being um, basically in love with slavery. In fact, he says that he's got a, um, Sumner says uh, uh, that Butler has got a mistress and his mistress is the harlot called slavery. Now that seems pretty harmless language maybe it was, but that's deeply offended um, Butler. You know, he's basically been um, told that there's something, you know, so wrong with the, the, the nature of the Southern way of life um, that some that has equated it with um, prostitution. Now Butler doesn't himself respond, but into the chamber after um, this speech is made known comes Preston Brooks, who was a nephew of um, Andrew Butler. And he comes in, questions Sumner, and um, doesn't get the response he would like, so he whacks Sumner over the head, and then he loses it, and he just continues to beat Sumner until his stick breaks. As a crowd gather and watch this, this spectacle. Now, Sumner um, is, uh, claims anyway he's badly injured. In fact, he doesn't come back to the Senate for three more years because of his injuries. Preston Brooks is regarded as being a Southern hero for what he's done. He's, um, you know, well, he, he's in danger of being kicked out of the Senate, but he resigns anyway and he's re elected by his people because they, they love him. In fact, he's even sent new sticks, new canes. Um, which had words inscribed on it, such as, you know, hit him harder next time and so on. So he, uh, he goes down as a hero. This is obviously from a northern um, cartoon because it says Southern Chivalry Argument versus cl uh, Club. So here is Sumner writing a speech with his pen, being beaten up by Southern violence with this um, club or cane. So Bleeding Sumner, which was reported across the nation in northern papers and southern papers, um, was enough to um, divide the nation further. There's a good little video clip here, which is quite funny actually, from Drunk History, that you can watch um, just to give you a little uh, reenaction of the, the Sumner um, caning. The point that we're interested in is the country is becoming more and more deeply divided in Kansas, and what is growing in Kansas uh, plays a part in that. Within this context of uh, violence, we have another election, the 1856 uh, election. And as I mentioned earlier on, there are three political parties now standing. And one of the old political parties is pretty much gone. So, there is um, the Whig Party, basically the, the dying embers of the Whig Party. Most Whigs have now moved their affiliation to either the Know Nothings or the Republican Party. The Republican Party to some extent, it's a reincarnation of the old Free Soil Party that we spoke about when we looked at the um, 1848 election. And there was a key part of the, the Republican Party, key part of its kind of manifesto, if you like, that was explicit in stating that it was a Free Soil Party. And I'll explain a bit more about that um, later on. 
Um, so the candidates uh, are uh, Fremont, famous explorer, was man kind of responsible for the liberation of California before it becomes a state. He is going to be the Republican candidate, Buchanan, the Democratic candidate, and Millard Fillmore, who had already been president after the death of um, Taylor, um, is now going to be the, the candidate for the Know Nothings, or sometimes referred to as the American Party. These are the nativists, um, is maybe the best way to think about them. Um, who wins the election? Um, it's a bit uh, closer this time um, than the 1852 election, but the Electoral College vote advantage um, is with the Democrats again, and um, they, they, they win the election um, comfortably. Um, so we're going to have four more years of the Democrats. Now Buchanan is um, going to be accused of being um, pro-South in his approach, uh, so it's something to bear in mind. Before we get to the last couple of events before the, the outbreak of war, um, I just want to show you something from this 1856. Um, electoral map, you can see quite clearly that something has happened to the um, American political landscape. The red democratic states are all in the south, one in California. The blue republican states, this is a brand new party right, and they've got 114 electoral college votes, so it's quite remarkable in itself. But all of their seats, all of their constituencies, all of their states that they hold are in the north. Now, you can see right that there's a, a gap of um, 60 electoral college votes. If there was to be a shift in a couple of these red states to um, blue, it could be that the new Republican Party could win the election of 1860. And not only could they win the election of 1860, they could win it without even sending out ballot papers in the South. All they need is northern states because the nature of the electoral college system in the, the US is that you get more electoral college votes based on the population of your state. So states with quite high populations are worth more and in the south which is more rural you can win more states but you don't get so many electoral college votes right. Still kind of slightly ridiculous system and the popular vote doesn't ultimately matter right as we have seen um, in recent times. So. If Pennsylvania was to flip, that would add 27 to the Republicans and it would take 27 away from the Democrats. You would then only need one other state to push the Republicans over the line. And Illinois could be that, or Indiana could be that, um, New Jersey could be that. And that is how 1856 really shows the fine margins we have between a party who could win the election and be a completely sectional party. I know it looks like the Democrats have become a sectional party here, but they're not. They still have candidates in the North. They still see themselves as being a national party. The Republican Party are not, at this point, even interested in becoming a national party. They know they're not going to win any votes in the South because of their um, political um, position on not so much slavery itself, but the expansion of slavery into the territories. Okay, we'll talk a bit more about that when we look at the 1860 election. Um, the final, or there's two kind of final events, but the main final event I want to talk about is the Dred Scott case. Now the Dred Scott case is kind of complicated, right? I'm just going to um, read a little bit here from the historian um, Louis Kleber to give us some background. Uh, Dred Scott was born in Virginia during um, the administration of President Jefferson, right? So he's, he's, he's an old guy. Dred Scott um, was eventually taken to Missouri, which was a slave state. Um, by his master. In the early 1830s he was sold to a man called Dr. John Emerson, who was an army surgeon. Shortly after, uh, this Dr. Emerson's responsibility took him to a free state, which was Illinois, and then to another territory um, in Minnesota. He was going there as a, an army surgeon. Um, um, but was then, um, as I said, um, not a state, but these are territories um, in, in Minnesota. Um, the change in residence, right, so going north for this period, um, would be a critical factor in this Fred Scott case, right, Scott's claim that he was a free man. Um, during this period, Dr. Emerson felt his wife needed help and he bought a young uh, black woman named Harriet, who subsequently married Dred Scott, and they both had children. Um, Emerson returned to Missouri in 1830, when he died in 1844. Two years after this, aided by anti-slavery lawyers, right, who knew about Dred Scott's um, story and history, um, Dred Scott stood for freedom um, and um, freedom of his family because he says, you know, he was uh, married and living and his kids were born 
in, in three territories. The suit was brought against Mrs. Emerson, who, with her brother, John Sanford, right, to complicate things more, now held the Doctor Doctor Emerson's estate because it didn't go to um, the woman went to this this brother-in-law, um, or brother, sorry. Um, Dred Scott, therefore, um, and the Dred Scott case raises some questions, right? The questions are critical questions, actually, at this point in American history. Um, could Dred Scott, being a slave, sue in a federal court for his freedom? Was he a citizen that could sue, or was he property? And how would the case affect this kind of broader issue about slavery and um, slave expansion? So, lots of questions were raised with this um, Dred Scott case. Eventually, it makes its way to the, the Supreme Court, right? And when it makes its way to the Supreme Court, it makes its way to the Supreme Court within the context of um, the events in Kansas, Nebraska, and Bleeding Sumner. And the way that the Supreme Court would rule could be actually fundamental to how slavery could um, either um, continue to thrive or if it could be kind of stopped in its tracks. So it goes to the, the Supreme Court. Uh, now Buchanan is in office and Buchanan in 1857, um, just as he's making his um, inaugural um, speech, is um, captured talking to um, the Supreme Court judge Judge Taney, who's going to be ruling on Dred Scott, and Buchanan says, look, whatever happens, happens with the Dred Scott decision, and we have to accept it, no matter what. Did he already know, was the accusation uh, laid out by Northerners, because he had this discussion with Taney. Because when the decision comes in, seven out of the nine judges declare Scott to be a slave. Five of these judges were slaveholders. Again, the accusation, accusation from Northerners. Here is evidence of the slave power at work. You've got a Supreme Court controlled by slaveholders, you've got a president who appears to be pro-slaveholder um, as well. So the court held, and this is, this is crucial right, the court held that African Americans, whether enslaved or free, could not be American citizens and therefore had no standing to sue in federal court and that the federal government had no power to regulate slavery in the federal territories acquired after the creation of the United States. So two crucial things here. Basically, number one, if you're black, you're not a citizen, which is, you know, dramatic development in American history. And number two, even if you're free and black, and number two, um, yeah, not only is the 1820 compromise line completely gone, right, 1854 had already done that with Kansas, Nebraska, but here was just another example of the Supreme Court now saying, slavery can go where it wants in these territories. This put great fear into Northerners. What if slavery actually started to spread to states? What's to stop slave owners possibly taking slaves wherever they wished? So this is um, this is really the beginning of a serious division within the country because all of a sudden, um, the North thinks that the South is in control. Very different to what Calhoun thought back in 1850. So more evidence of the slave power at work. Um, in Kansas, Buchanan is also supporting the pro-slavers irrespective of the fact that the vote was clearly corrupt. Um, were there southern fears during this point? Well, possibly um, the fears in the south were um, potential for slave revolts, that northerners were maybe trying to encourage uh, their slaves now to, to run away or start a rebellion, or abolitionists were encouraging this. Um, when black men were told that they were um, not citizens, what future do they really um, have in the United States and um, you can read a little bit in Source 6 about the, the ramifications of the, the, the Dred Scott case but there's a really good little section here from the expert historian David Blight who you'll see on my set you can watch a video lecture from Blight and um, basically he, he makes that point you know to be black in the late 1850s was to live in a land that said you did not have a, a future and the Dred Scott decision um, leads to despair amongst black communities despair amongst um, abolitionists and um, I just want to kind of focus this last bit of highlighting because it's crucial for where the country was at at this point the Dred Scott decision and the birth of the Republican Party which we've just seen in the Republican Party's manifesto stating that it's not opposed to slavery where it exists but it's opposed to slavery expanding um, into the West and it, it's, there's even a, um, a, a section in the 1856 Republican Party program which says Kansas must be free 
Um, so this kind of new crisis that develops over slavery um, is important in, in the South and among slaves themselves. We have plenty of evidence, says Blight, that shows us that beginning in 1856 with the presidential election, and again in 1858 with congressional elections, and certainly in 1860, which we're going to get to in a second, there's a lot of reaction in the southern white press saying that slave owners should keep their slaves away from political meetings because the more slaves gather around these political meetings, the more they're going to become aware of the political crisis. And therefore there's a fear of insurrection in southern states. Plantation owners better watch out because slaves might be ready to um, um, either leave en masse or create some type of um, um, violent um, episode. Now, 1858 is an important um, year, important um, for what you have to explore on the on this essay topic because it's the first time we really get a chance to look at Lincoln's words. And Lincoln is going to become the president in 1860. One of the reasons why the South leaves the Union and secedes in 1861 is because they believe that Lincoln is abolitionist. They are not willing to truly read exactly or listen to exactly what Lincoln has said and we get a little information exactly on what Lincoln has said um, in 1848 sorry 1858 um, during the congressional elections where he was fighting for the senate seat in Illinois with again Stephen Douglas right who's very much part of this story um, just before these debates take place Lincoln makes a speech in um, Illinois and um, he this is a very famous speech. He makes his views clear, or does he make them clear, on the issue of slavery? This is known as a house divided speech. And I'll just read it and point out some key aspects of it. A house divided, says Lincoln, against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. Right? So he's confident there's not going to be you know, a, a, a splitting up of the nation. He's wrong in that respect. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect they will cease to be divided. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and the place uh, and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that in its course of ultimate extinction or its advocates will push it forward till it shall become alike lawful in all states old as well as new, north as well as south. This speech is fundamental because here is Lincoln stating exactly what his position is on slavery. He's not saying that he wants to abolish slavery but he is saying that it might eventually um, die out. In fact in the subsequent speeches that he makes in these debates that he has with Stephen Douglas right which are known as the Lincoln Douglas debates and I've listed some of them um, for you here. In these future uh, debates that take place in 1858 before the election for, for um, the Senate he actually does make his views clear in fact he says that Okay, he, he accepts that slaves and white people are not equal, or blacks and white people are not equal, but he also says he doesn't want to abolish slavery, he can't abolish slavery, he just believes that it can't be extended. When um, Douglas has asked that question, Douglas says, well, it doesn't really, really matter. Um, he basically says if, if, if slavery um, is to legally be allowed across any of these territories, if the people who live in that territory don't want it, they will just not allow for it not the most strong argument that is put forward by Douglas whereas Lincoln is, is much um, clearer um, and he does he does state that he just wants to stop the spread of slavery. Now for those southerners in 1860 um, when the, the next election takes place when those um, southerners decide that um, they want to leave the Union they say well it's because Lincoln is an abolitionist. If they had really read his words then um, they would have known that he was not, but maybe they read his House Divided speech because that was the most famous. And in this House Divided speech, he is saying that the country will go one way or the other. And maybe they took that to mean that Lincoln was intent on abolishing slavery. I don't think that really was his, his position. The House Divided speech may probably cause more harm than it did good. So the final event before the 1860 election is known as the 1859 Harper's Ferry Raid. And another character who we've already spoken about comes back into the equation, that's John Brown. Um, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because I really want you to look at this in chapter 8 of My City because there's some really useful newspaper articles here, one from the north, one from the south and one from the, the kind of uh, middle states of the country, the border states. And um, 
what is interesting is really the reaction to the Brown raid. Basically, John Brown tries to start a, a slave revolt. It is a complete disaster, right? It finishes pretty quickly. Uh, Brown is um, arrested. Some people are killed in the process. He's caught, tried, executed. He makes this statement um, at the time where he says, um, you know, this, this uh, basically his last words before he goes to the gallows. He says, you know, the crimes of this land will only be solved through the shedding of blood, as if he predicts the civil war, um, which he does do to some extent, because that is eventually what happens to address the ultimate issue of slavery. But what is interesting here is that Southerners find some evidence that so-called black republicanism, i.e. members of the Republican Party that are pro-anti-slavery, that they had maybe helped or financed or assisted John Brown. And when that happened, the South really do think that their institution is under attack. And you get militias in the South forming to make sure that there are no um, examples or potential examples of um, slave revolts. So fear is what we get. Scaremongering is what we get in the South. In the North, most politicians do say that what Brown does is wrong, but he becomes a hero for ordinary men and women and abolitionists and think that John Brown is a martyr. So we get to the 1860 election and with every election things just get worse. So from 1852 to 56 things get worse, from 56 to 60 things get worse. The country is split, split. Again you have to think about this question. Who do you think is responsible for pushing the country closer and closer to separation? Um, 1860 election I mentioned what had to happen um, from the, the previous election and what had to happen was obviously uh, a shift, enough of a shift to kind of favour the Republicans for Lincoln to be elected. Lincoln's chances of being elected are increased by the fact that the Republican Party now splits. The Republican Party, which had managed up until this point to maintain some type of unity, um, is split between the Northern Wing and the Southern Wing. So the Northern Wing is Stephen Douglas, who is the candidate. The, and the Southern Wing is John C. Breckinridge. You've also got a Constitutional Union Party which um, tries to kind of gather some of the old Whigs. The popular vote goes away of Lincoln, who is representing the Republican Party. The electoral college vote um, is going to go the way of um, Lincoln as well. And the overall um, outcome of the election is... Here we go. Um, it's a victory. As you can see, the electoral college vote um, of 180 for Lincoln, and he takes those key states that I mentioned in Pennsylvania and Indiana, and in Illinois, he doesn't take New Jersey, but he's taken more than enough. And if you add to that the division or the divide amongst the Democrats, it's an easy victory. The Republicans are now the governing party. They are anti-slavery expansion. How do you think the South are going to respond to this? Especially when the North um, and the Republican Party in the North has never in any way even tried to pretend that they care about the interests of Southerners. They're also, if you look at the Republican Party Manifesto, they're also kind of pro-manufacturing, pro-banking, pro-business. Again, they don't appear to appeal to any of the kind of Southern um, concerns. So as soon as Lincoln becomes president, there's a, there's a problem, right? And the problem is a problem for um, the South in general. So the, um, the South really think that the election in 1860 is the end of, of slavery, right? Even if we know that that was not uh, necessarily um, Lincoln's intentions. Um, Outspoken slave owners, politicians, Southern press, they all start playing a key role in forging Southern attitudes post an election. Uh, Lincoln's politics, you could argue, were still relatively ambiguous. His speeches of 1858 did not always clarify his views because of the House divided speech. Although if you read carefully, you can see what his ultimate view was. Secession, as you know, it has been discussed as far back as the 1830s in South Carolina. Now it has become a distinct possibility. As I mentioned, these vigilance committees and militias start to patrol the South to um, check that there are no potential slave revolts. Um, if states from the South did start to secede, would Lincoln go to war to try and bring these states back into the Union? Now, South Carolina, as you can see here, is the first country to jump ship um, in December 1860. Lincoln is not president, Buchanan is president, but Buchanan does very little. He lets things drift. Lincoln does not become president until March 1860. So there's three months where Buchanan, the Democrat, is doing nothing. Um, before South Carolina left the Union, Southern senators and congressmen met on a number of occasions discussing the possibility of secession. South Carolina right, takes the lead in December 1860 and they issue their Declaration 
um, of causes of cessation and they state in this declaration, and I'll read it exactly, those states have assumed the right of deciding upon the property of our domestic institutions, he's talking about the North, and have denied the rights of property established in 15 of the states and recognised by the Constitution. They have denounced as sinful the institution of slavery. They have encouraged and assisted thousands of our slaves to leave their homes. And those who remain have been incited by books and pictures to servile insurrection. So the fear in the South is one where they look back over the last 10 years and they pick the, pits, the, the bits and pieces, the events that have taken place, and they say, yeah, here's evidence of Northern grievance, here's evidence of Northern grievance. They dismiss all of the Southern um, aggressive actions that obviously were a grievance to the North. But in this particular state of South Carolina, they, they jump, they make the jump, they make the commitment. And following South Carolina, we then get Mississippi, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Louisiana, and um, in Texas. Um, there's just a little summary of what I've, I've read. Um, the response of the government right to this ordinance of secession under Buchanan is nothing. Did this mean that the South believed that they could get away with secession? But when Lincoln comes to power in March, Lincoln's going to take a much different approach. Lincoln is inaugurated, people have thrown compromise proposals at him, uh, at him. he rejects all of these, he um, refuses to extend the extension of the Missouri Compromise Line, he um, thinks there's only one way to bring the Union back together. If the South don't basically say that they will come back, then there'll have to be some type of war. Now, Lincoln does not declare war on the South, although some Northerners want, you know, um, an attack, but there are other Northerners who think the South should just go alone, you know, the North is better off without them. But the entire Union was threatened, because if states can leave when they want, then eventually the whole country could eventually split up. So Lincoln's going to have to try and pressurise the South to come back in to the Union. War is a possibility. But he doesn't have to consider it because the South fired the first shots. This new state, this new country, the Confederate States, are the ones who fired the first shots, famously at Fort Sumter um, in 1861. And war breaks out in April 1861, and from that point onwards, um, we have got this four-year um, civil war, which will have you know remarkable ramifications for the United States. Because the South fired those first shots, because they are the ones who leave the Union, when you look at the very short term factors, it's quite easy to blame the South. They didn't have to leave the Union. The North didn't leave the Union when the South had the upper hand. They have rejected a democratic vote. Slavery is not being threatened, only the extension of slavery has been threatened. So at the very point when the war breaks out, it does look like the South are to blame. But you can decide for yourself if you think the North are to blame. Think about what exactly, what exactly is within this ordinance of secession um, and, and, and make that decision for yourself. Do you think that the um, the North have to take some responsibility for why South Carolina and the following states decided to secede? Okay, that's all for now and um, I'll point you in the right direction of the My City activities that you should complete in your own time. Thank you.